Ukraine's next election cycle seemed to be a long way away. But we're about to hit the summer recess just ahead of when the election campaign will probably begin in September. Ukraine held its last presidential elections in May 2014 and parliamentary elections in October 2014. Um, we know that Petro Poroshenko won the presidential and uh, pro-Western political forces won a constitutional majority in the parliamentary. That's unlikely to change because pro-Russian forces simply don't have the popularity um, yet and they, um, they're unlikely to revive in any great way between now and then. What is surprising is that no young um, kind of candidates have emerged from the Euromaidan. So the opinion polls show us that the main people who will be contesting the presidential elections are people from the old guard from the 1990s. Um, the three leading candidates um, at the moment um, are Petro Poroshenko. It's usually the case that the sitting president in Ukraine goes through to the second round, so that's pretty much an automatic, um, followed by Yuli Tymoshenko and Yuri Boyko, um, the former minister of energy under President Yanukovych and now um, um, one of the joint leaders of the so-called opposition bloc. It's probably likely that we, at this stage anyway, that we're going to see a second round between Timoshenko and Poroshenko. Um, who then, um, uh, what kind of things will emerge into the open? Well, one of the news items in the last week or so has been the, de been a, um, the court decision in the arbitration court in Stockholm concerning the 2009 gas contract. To a, to a great degree, that, that did help um, Timoshenko's image because she was very negatively associated with the high price of gas linked to that gas contract. At the same time, um, knowing that period very well, and one can find many documents um, um, on that period, sort of 2008-2009, um, in the uh, leaked U.S. diplomatic cables from Kiev, published under WikiLeaks, what was going on was a very bizarre situation that both camps in the, um, in the so-called pro-Western National Democratic Forces were both seeking Russian allies. Very, very strange time in Ukrainian political history. On the one hand, you had Viktor Yushchenko, who was a sitting incumbent president, who was in bed since 2004 when he came to power, after the Orange Revolution, with the the gas oligarch, the well-known well gas oligarch, Dimitro Firtash. Um, Firtash had cooperated with Yushchenko throughout this period. Viktor uh, Yushchenko's brother, Petro Yushchenko, a member of our Ukraine, um, was um, receiving financial dividends from that, from the various gas intermediaries like Ros Ukran Energo. And Yushchenko himself was demanding that Firtash invest in his pet historical and other projects. So during that period of time, Firtash um, gave a large donation to Cambridge University in Britain to set up a Ukrainian studies program, and also a large donation to the Ukraine Catholic University in Lviv. Um, he also helped to finance the rebuilding of the Cossack uh, camp at Baturin, um, near Zaporizhia at the time. So this was all... Firtash's links to, to Yushchenko. One of the final, more recent examples of this is Firtash's donation of $2.5 million for the opening of the Holodomor monument in Washington, D.C. in 2015. So there was a, a close connection between the two. Firtash and the gas lobby and Yushchenko were very hostile to Timoshenko. Um, Yushchenko's pro-NATO, pro-Western position was undermined by his links to Putin's agent in Ukraine, Firtash. So a, a, ma a major contradiction there. And Firtash was very unhappy at Timoshenko trying to close down um, gas intermediaries in Ukraine like Ros Ukrenergo. 
In December 2008, Timoshenko um, received a good offer from Putin of about $250 per 1,000 cubic meters of gas. Um, this was torpedoed by Firtash and Yushchenko. Then there was the gas crisis during a bad winter where there were gas interruptions flowing to Europe. Um, and then the next deal that was signed later in January was a terrible deal, and that was close to something like between three hundred fifty and four hundred and fifty dollars, which was kept by Putin throughout this period of time up until about two thousand and fourteen, two thousand and fifteen. Um, although Yanukovych was very pro-Russian, Putin refused to lower the gas price even for him, um, and it's only because of the Euro Maidan authorities today who have um, been able to um, ensure that since 2015, Ukraine no longer imports gas from Russia. It imports its gas from its Western neighbors. Um, yes, this is originally Russian gas, but Ukraine's buying gas from Slovakia, Hungary, and even Germany, not from Russia anymore. So Ukraine today is completely energy independent from, from Russia. So we had one camp in Ukraine, the Yushchenko camp, in bed with Firtash and therefore in bed with pro-Russian forces. Uh, the Timoshenko camp, on the other hand, was also in bed with pro-Russian forces, with Viktor Medvedchuk, and indirectly, therefore, with, um, with, with Putin as well. Uh, Med Medvedchuk, a rather bizarre um, individual in Ukrainian politics, his um, daughter has Putin as her godfather, and um, her godmother is the wife of Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev. So that shows you the connection. It's bizarre because Medvedchuk's father in World War II, according to Ukrainian researchers, was the head of, an, of a Nazi office that sent Ukrainians as slave laborers to Germany. My father was one of those. Um, but he was from West Ukraine. This is in Zhitomir. Um, Medvedchuk claims that's not true. He claims his father was a member of OUN. Petro Potichny, the well-known expert, the editor of Le Topi Supa, says that he has no record of Medvedchuk as father ever being a member of OUN. So when the Soviets recaptured Zhitomir in 1944, um, they were deported to Siberia where Medvedchuk was born. And um, so Medvedchuk's father was either a Nazi collaborator or a member of OUN, probably the former. How is he, therefore, now in bed with Putin, whose father was a member of the NKVD? <laughs> now, that is a strange, strange relationship. One, way is, one reason for that probably is because, uh, as I wrote in an article this week, um, the uh, Medvedchuk in the 1970s was forced to become a KGB informer, um, after he, he was involved in a violent crime, um, which was was removed from his record. He became a KGB informer. He was allowed to finish his legal studies. And then he became a, an official Soviet lawyer. And he was the so-called, in inverted commas, defense lawyer for well-known Ukrainian dissident Vasil Stus. So Benedichuk has a lot of baggage. Um, He's about as discredited as Viktor Yanukovych in Ukraine. Um, and my article this week was asking, therefore, why Donald Trump's election campaign in 2016 was reaching out to Medvedchuk, a very bizarre person to reach out to, presumably because he, was Putin, he is Putin's agent in Ukraine. But in 2009-2010, the, the person who had strong ties to Medvedchuk was Yulia Tymoshenko, um, he provided financing for summer of our election campaign in 2010, and this built on the record after the Orange Revolution of, um, of members of Medvedchuk's Social Democratic Unity Party joining um, the Butte or Block of Yulia Tymoshenko, a political force. Um, because and of people like Mr. Hupsky and others. So by 2010. You had a kind of um, a um, 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 both sides of the national democratic pro-Western camp, the Yushchenko camp and the Timoshenko camp, were trying to do deals with people in Moscow in different ways. 
So today, um, if we have a election battle that is going to be a contest between uh, Timoshenko and Poroshenko, it's going to be very, very dirty. A lot of this is going to come out into the open. Um, there is no kind of um, baggage that Poroshenko has links linked to Putin. Yes, Poroshenko did um, have businesses in Russia, but these were businesses. They weren't kind of linked to politics or any, in any way. And um, the, 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 key, the key questions here are going to be, um, to what degree is this going to lead to President Putin trying to use his compromat, his compromising materials, to somehow influence the campaign? We know from the whole question of Trump, Russia links, that the Russians are very good at um, developing compromat. Um, we know that from Putin, from Trump's visit to uh, Russia in 2013, when there was the World Beauty Contest there, and there certainly is probably some of that compromat on both Yushchenko and on Timoshenko. Um, we, it won't work in her favor that the uh, her former um, business partner Pavlo Lazarenko will be going up for trial again, or will be on trial again next year in the U.S. as well. So the, all of these things will be shaping the, um, the Ukrainian election campaign. And the question of Poroshenko, I think um, the difference between Poroshenko and Timoshenko can be compared to our Western politicians. Um, Poroshenko is somebody that... Um, you might like him, you might dislike him. But there's a lot of people in the middle who say, eh, he's okay, he's not that bad. You know, there are not people who really hate him or maybe people who really love him, um, which is probably good for a politician um, in many ways. People, it gives a lot of scope for people to change their minds. In the case of Timoshenko, she's more like Trump um, in the sense of you either hate her or you love her. There is no middle ground. Um, one of the most strangest things about Timoshenko is how many women you meet, including in the Ukrainian diaspora, who do not like her. <laughs> Maybe for old traditional view, traditionalist views. So this is going to be, um, uh, if, if it does end up, and at the moment at least, only you know, 18 months, just a bit more towards the elections, that Timoshenko and Poroshenko are the main candidates, then a lot of this previous baggage is going to come out into the open. Um, when that does come out into the open, Timoshenko is going to look worse than Poroshenko, I think, um, because she can't really argue that Poroshenko is an oligarch and she's not, because all Ukrainian political forces are financed by oligarchs to varying degrees. Um, there are no political forces independent of Ukrainian oligarchs and big business. And um, and Poroshenko's argument is going to be that he is um, the last Ukrainian uh, who will be a post-Soviet president, as he describes himself, and that after he is um, in office, um, he would hope to pass it to the non-Soviet generation. I mean, one of the one of the some of the many positive, unfortunate, unfortunate as well, because there's a war and people have died. But the positive aspects coming out of the conflict with Russia is that in the last three years, and even more so by the time of the 2019 elections, that Ukraine is finally divorcing itself from the communist past. You have four decommunization laws. You have the breaking of um, ties and relations with Russia in a whole range of areas economic, military, industrial complex, social media, you name it, the list grows by the month. And a lot of this is self-inflicted by Russia. It's not just Ukraine doing it. Um, and so those ties have been broken. And more importantly, the psychological ties of the so-called Stalinist myth of brotherly nations is dead, is finished. Um, this was introduced by Stalin in the late 30s, and it, it went very much, very deep into the heads, particularly of Eastern Ukrainians and then the older generation. Well, obviously, that is now finished, and you can't turn the clock back. 
Um, I remember in April 14 in Kiev, a taxi driver asking me, is there going to be war? And I said, yes, looks like it. And the driver said to me, how can we fight our brothers? Well, this was, in, this was three years ago. I somehow doubt that he still thinks that Russians are brothers after they've occupied Crimea and they have launched an undeclared war against eastern Ukraine. So Ukraine um, in the last three years is very different and will be very different by the next elections compared to after the Orange Revolution. And in this respect, um, Poroshenko comes out better than Timoshenko, Yushchenko after the Orange Revolution, when literally the, the entire period of time was a waste of time. Nothing much concrete was done. If anything, Ukraine missed the opportunity in 2006 to join the membership action plan, which is the preparation stage for joining NATO. Since 2014, not everything has been done that many of us would have liked, but a lot more has been done. Institutions have been created, an army has been built in Ukraine, and patriotism has grown. This book, again, shows to what degree the views of Eastern and Southern Ukrainians, uh, primarily Russian speakers, have become more closer to the views of Central Ukrainians. So that national identity has moved East and South. Um, and that's why you see so many Russian speakers helping in volunteer, volunteer movements and fighting on the front lines. So um, that break with Russia, which probably would have taken a long time if there was no war, um, you know, these changes in identity take a long period of time, has been speeded up. And the person involved in that is Poroshenko. Um, so I think it's going to be an extremely fascinating election campaign because of uh, what's taken place since 2014, past baggage, particularly after the Orange Revolution, and of course, past baggage from the 1990s as well. Um, and if you were to, if it does end up in the last um, second round of, um, at the moment it looks like it's either Poroshenko, Timoshenko, less likely Poroshenko, Yuri Boyko, um, then then we know what we're dealing with, as it were. Um, the unknown could be uh, young Euromaidan candidates emerging at the last moment. It's going to be very difficult for them to break through. Um, so um, at least with the ones that I've talked about, we know their background and we know where they come from and where they stand. Um, any of these people involved with the whole Orange Revolution era from 2005-2010, uh, whether it's Yushchenko, Temoshenko, or such like, have been very discredited from that period. And therefore, it's going to be very difficult for Timoshenko to change that image that she has from that period of time. Poroshenko has, in many ways, reinvented himself since 2014. As I say, he's not done everything that many of us would have liked, particularly in the area of fighting corruption, and oligarchs, but at the same time, you know, I would not would have I would not have liked to be in Poroshenko in 2014, becoming president of a country that's bankrupt, has no army, and your big powerful neighbor has just invaded you. Wow, wow, um, that's one hell of a job to take on. And you know, um, Ukraine stopped Russian aggression, turned it back. And also Ukraine's econ economy and finances are this year doing quite well and improving. And these are, this is the view not just of me, of, of, of IMF, World Bank and elsewhere. So the shoots of that recovery are coming through. And there's a lot of positive things to uh, say about Ukraine this year. Ukraine's association agreement is going forward, visa-free regime um, and such like. So um, there's... I think that the worst period of time was in 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017 is Ukraine's revival. By 2019, Ukraine will have been even more divorced from its Soviet and Russian neighbor. And um, the, the one to thank for that will be, I guess, the existing president, but also, of course, the Ukrainian people and especially the volunteers 
who rushed to defend Ukraine in 2014 and who are still helping Ukraine to this very day. Thank you.